Comrades, this is a new video with the RBMK simulator. This is the first one I will be using the port game published by Comrade DZX in his blog. So I strongly advise to go to his blog and follow all his description. He made a great job at describing all the processes in this simulator and in the nuclear reactor. And in this blog you will find links to the GitHub page GDZX in which you can download the setup Chernobyl setup.exe and the two uh, user manuals. The first one is the same I provided in previous versions, which was the same provided by Comrade 3DR long before me. And the second one is a conversion from WordPerfect to PDF. So it's a full digital. That's really great. Judging by the extension .fr, I assume Comrade DZX is Frank. So if this is the case, merci beaucoup, camarade. Ça, c'est un génial boulot que tu as mis ensemble. Et merci beaucoup pour me citer dans ton blog, ça m'a vraiment touché. Let's go back to English and jump right into the simulator. First of all, I want to cite uh, Matt PD, former full battery, who made me aware of this new port version, and CD really, who recently changed his channel name, so he is the former 3DR. And recently he posted three videos of a generic PWR simulator. Uh, they are about five hours each, uh, except the turbine startup, which is like 22 minutes. So I strongly advise you to follow them because he's, he's really knowledgeable about nuclear technology. So I already installed this port version in my Windows computer. So uh, I didn't mention, but of course, this port version works in 64-bit computers. So you don't need emulators or anything like uh, we used to run before with the version from MatPD. So when you install it, it goes to the folder right into the C root of your computer and you need to run Chernobyl.exe. You are greeted with this high resolution screen. I will dismiss the video, but it's nice to watch. You can wait for it by yourself. Well, hi. I will pause here. Don't worry, the game will be full screen. It's just the videos that, because they are in native resolution, they they show up very small in modern screens. I didn't even realize you were done down in security. I'm glad you're up here now. We need to get started, and we need to do as good a job as we can. As you know, when we bid against the French to get this operations contract, we had no idea this plant was in the shape it was in. Even though we got the contract, I think the French won. But that's beside the point. You're here. We've got to do the best we can right now. Make sure you understand this unit. Go to the training room. Get everything you can from those folks down there, because if you don't understand this RBMK-1000, it's going to eat your lunch. This is a lot different than the American BWR and PWRs. So you've got to learn this plan. Things are a lot more relaxed here than they were in the U.S. from the standpoint of regulation, but it's all on our shoulders to make this plant safe, and there isn't a lot of money to make this plant safe. You're going to have to do the best you can on very little money. Balance safety versus the budget. The budget's always going to win, I'm afraid, but keep it safe. Do the best you can. If you need anything, come and ask. Good luck to you. Okay, so these are the four initial conditions or we can say difficulty levels of this game. Easiest is one and goes up to four. So the higher you go, the more difficult it is to keep the budget positive or making a surplus of money. And the more uh, uh, material damage or maintenance schedules you will have. So it will be more difficult to maintain the plan in operation. So we'll start with the easiest one, which is plant operator. Hi, just came from Human Resources. Uh, it's official. You were awarded the plant operator's job. Good luck to you. Right now, the plant's up and running fairly well. It's surprising, but it's at full load right now. There doesn't seem to be too many problems. Uh, anything comes up, deal with it to the best of your abilities. If you have any questions, go to the training department. Make sure you know what's going on. Let's not make any mistakes here. Good luck to you. And again, congratulations on the plant operator's job. Thank you. OK, let's start. We'll maximize this. Don't worry about the resolution. It looks really small, but actually we don't need to use this too much because then, you know, we will open all these panels 
and we'll fill all the space around the main panel. So I will organize it as I usually do with the chart here, the absorber rod control here, and more or less organize it around the main panel in a similar shape as we have in the in the main panel. So reactor power regulation here. Now it's at 100 percent power. So unless we have some alarm or something, in principle we don't need to do anything. Okay, I will put the loop one and loop two down here. Turbine control below the reactor. Loop one and loop two. Emergency core cooling system. I just check how is it. So we have the pump one and two stop and the system in auto. Which... Tell me something. Have you looked at the reactor fueling schedule? You've got to get some fuel in this reactor. You're burning okay, up the Okay, okay. Okay, okay. So ECC is in the correct setting, so I will not leave it because it will take too much space. Oh, sorry. Yes, reactor drain control. Let's put it here. It's in auto. Set point is at three. That's good. Okay, and now that I see this, it seems that the units are in inches. Uh, imperial system. So to be accurate to the all Soviet Union, I will switch to metric system, which we can do in this window here. Options, units, metric. Okay. And you see this seems to be 7.6 centimeters. Okay. Turbine control. Where is it? I don't see it appearing anywhere. Okay, turbine control was here, sorry. The aerator pressure control. Let's leave it here. I will leave a row here for the for the schematics. The aerator pressure control. Condenser vacuum ejector. I know people have some nightmares with this and the disk rupture. But don't worry, because in this version you can fix the rupture disk. Main steam dam control. Which is set at what? 115. Um, I think the units are kilopascals, so it's 11.5 megapascals, yeah? Turbine support systems, which are okay. We Usually you only operate on those during startup and shutdown. Condenser circulating water. Okay, the two pumps are on. Just check the diagram, the, the general schematics. So you see the two pumps of the condenser, condenser circulating water are on. We have two, two feed water pumps and two condensate pumps and two in each loop of the reactor recirculation pumps. The makeup system, they are off. Okay, everything looks fine. And the reactor is generating 966 megawatts. Okay. Makeup system, let's put it here. It's stop in both sides and the valves are open. Feed what pumps and system. Let's put it here. EPA filters, I will not open it now, but I will the condensate system. Okay. Now that we have all the panels, let's go for the schematics. Definitely we need reactor core status. Let's put it here, maybe we need to move those. Let's keep an eye on fuel burn up, which we have here. It's at 65%. So even if uh, our boss keeps reminding us about fuel scheduling, don't worry while you are above 50%. When you get close to 40%, that starts to be dangerous because Below 38, depending on what's the fuel uh, usage pattern, 
you could have a really sharp drop in power. But as I said, about 40, it's totally okay. And about 50, you wouldn't even need to think about refueling. So, okay. I will relocate this a bit. And open the steam drum following the reactor. I like to follow up with the order of the water. The aerator flow and feed water system. Okay, so we'll relocate this and maybe put this here. That looks good. Oops. Again. Okay. So the last one we need is the steam turbine status. Let's put it here and the trends. Yeah, here. Okay, the only left is the alarms, which we can locate it here. Okay, I think we have all the main things we need for normal operation. Everything's stable now. You see the lines in the trends are totally flat. I mean vertical but it means they are not moving. Let's have a look at fuel burn up, still 62%. We're at a power set point of 100%. Neutron flux 99.9. .9. Don't worry too much here. I know with the old versions, people will freak out here because once you hit 100, you have a meltdown in all versions. Here you can go above 100 and nothing happens. I mean, not immediately if you go to far away. Far above 100, you will melt the fuel or something. But you can even set a set point as high as 105%, which is great. It's really great because you don't have this panic to, to hit 100. And you see, thermal power is 99.5, so quite high. That's good. Let's check drum pressure. It's 10,000 kilopascal. 10 megapascal. It's a bit high, so it means we could open a bit more the valve control signal of the turbine to try to generate a bit more of power. Now we're generating 969 megawatt. So I will go um I will go manual. So now we are in auto, it means the pressure set point is set at at this value. And the system is closing and opening the valve to keep this pressure value. Which you see is the same the pressure set point as the drum pressure. So somehow, not somehow, uh, the, the drum pressure is regulated by the valve of the turbine. So what we will do now is to switch to manual. At this moment, it's not anymore the pressure set point that governs the opening of the valve, but the valve is stuck at this value, so we can govern the valve directly. So I will increase slowly. Let's go to 85%. Have you used your fuel monitor lately to check the fuel in your reactor? I yes, would suggest you sorry so. so much. But I will do when the fuel burn up is, uh, let's say, 40 something. So one great extra is that you can, you can disconnect or disable videos. So the real game has videos by default, but if they are too annoying for you, you just uh, un uncheck this here. Same for fuel and malfunctions. You can not have fuel burn up and you can, if you don't want, not have malfunctions. For the moment, I will leave all on so you see all the possibilities of this game. So let's continue opening the valve control signal. What I want is to get a higher um, drum steam flow, so this will increase the power that we generate in the turbine. The end goal of this game is to generate money, so the more, the higher the power we generate, the more money we will get. So I will open the budget display. Okay, uh, change, and this gives us an indication of what we are earning per minute. So you see income, $316, and you have the expenses uh, by power usage, equipment, maintenance, labor, and miscellaneous. 
Okay, so now we are in a positive rate, this is good, but the higher is this number here, the generator load, the higher will be the income. So let's keep increasing the valve control signal. Okay, 90. Maybe it's too sharp of an increase. Okay, it seems fine. But be careful, if you keep the mouse over the arrow, even without clicking, sometimes it just keeps rising. I don't know why, so be careful about that. You see reactor level increases when you increase flow. This is because you are reducing pressure in the drum. When you reduce pressure, you do two things happen. One is that the volume of the reactor content expands because it's partially uh, gas, because there is a boiling within the reactor. And second is that the boiling itself increases its rate because at lower, at equal heat from the fuel, and uh, lower pressure, you will have a uh, more boiling. So, yeah, that's why you have a, a reactor level increase, and you don't want to increase too much because if it spills over the exit of the drum, you could send liquid water to the turbine, and that would break the turbine. Okay, let's increase a bit more the opening of the valve control signal, and you see. We already decrease the pressure to 93 or oh, 9.3 megapascal. So what's the minimum? I don't know exactly, but I think it's about around 7.5 megapascal. Below that value, we'll get an alarm of low steam temperature. What happens if the steam temperature is too low? I think um, with too low temperature, you will start to have condensation in the output steam from the drum so so that steam could carry droplets of water going to the turbine causing two things one is mechanical damage because of the momentum that these droplets bring with them and second is corrosion so this is just my initial guess of the immediate problems the second one with too low too low pressure Basically, the reactor system will work out of specs because this is a boiling reactor. Well, not exactly, okay? It's an RBMK, but basically water boils within the drum and within the reactor core. So if you decrease the temperature, sorry, the pressure, you will have more boiling, more voiding, which is the ratio of uh, steam within the reactor water, which changes the neutronic parameters and reactivity of the nuclear reaction. Okay, things stabilized at 9 megapascal, so we'll keep opening a bit the valve. And you see how we increase the generated load? We are up at above 1000 megawatts, while before we were at around 966, I think. And the income is $327 now per minute. So let's see at fuel burn up. It's just 53%. It's okay. Don't worry. What we will do to refuel is go line by line. So when I find it appropriate to do a refueling, I will decrease power set point to 95 or to 90%. And at this power set point, we will extract two, two fuel bundles from each one of the channels and through them to the spent fuel here. And then replenish this channel with two new fuel bundles. Be careful because if you drop slightly off from this bin, it will spill on the containing building. It will create a big mess. You need, you need to clean up that here. Clean up, drop fuel bundles, and this costs money. So yeah, be careful while refueling not to drop it outside the corresponding bin. Okay, everything is stable. Generated load 115 megawatts. Let's keep increasing valve control signal. Let's go to 95. Let's go to 96. Yeah, that looks fine. Okay, we'll have a look at the condensate system control now. 
The Polisher one is in and is at 24% of exhaust, exhaustion. And the Polisher two is out and it's at 0%. So the percentage, it's like the cleaning, cleaningness or the, the how much you used it. So this is like one quarter of its lifespan used. Probably when you get a, to high values, maybe 80%, it will start not cleaning so well. It will have some overflow. So basically when the conductivity indicator here in the drum and in the deaerator goes high, you need to, to do something about the polishers. For the moment, the conductivity is just 1% and 0.9%. So this within a normal operation, water is clean. Conductivity indicates you how many salts are dissolved in the water. So low conductivity means clean water. So that's good. If we have high conductivity, we will end up with corrosion of the different parts of this nuclear power plant. Later, I will um, explain how to regenerate the polishers when they get too dirty. Okay, generated load is 1028 megawatts. We'll keep increasing valve control signal. We're already at 98.8%. So as far as the drum pressure doesn't go below the allow allowable mini minimum, what we want is to have the valve control signal as open as possible. This is what will give the best thermal performance of the system, because basically what a valve control, what the valve does in the turbine, is to slow down the income of steam by drag. So it makes an it's like a brake uh, that doesn't allow the steam to bring more power to the turbine. But of course, this brake is dissipating energy. So if we can open it at 100%, this will be the best uh, electricity generating wise. So we're already at 98.8%. Everything is stable. So I think I will go to 100%. And this is the optimal setting to produce the maximum power in the turbine. We see the we see the pressure in the drum 7800 kilopascal. So we are slightly above the minimum which is 74 7500 kilopascal so that's fine. Even if we are slightly below Have you used your fuel monitor lately? Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Even slightly below the minimum you just get a warning. It's not like a shutdown or a scram or anything. Okay, so fuel burn up is 47.6%. We could still wait a bit more for refueling, but I will just do it now. So, what I will do now, because the valve control is already at 100% and the pressure, the pressure in the drum looks good, I will go back to auto. And this will remember this, um, this pressure here. What I will do is to set a pressure slightly below, like 700. You can input this with your keyboard. And this means that as far as the pressure is not below 700, the valve control will keep the valve open at 100%. As I said, it's okay to go a bit below 7400 kilopascal because you just get a warning, it's not a scram. I will just check if I'm still recording because I have numerical shor shortcuts. Okay. So now we'll refill a bit. Why I did this switch to auto? Because to refill, I want to decrease a bit power set point. So I will go to 90%. And if I did this without changing the setting to auto, we could dangerously go below the set the minimum pressure in the drum because we're decreasing heat generation. So now that the we have a safe margin until the 100% power. Okay, and this, this is an alarm. I will check what is it. Low main steam temperature. Okay, acknowledge. We get this alarm because I set the set point below the minimum. If I didn't want to hear the alarm, I could have set the set point at 74 or 7500 kilopascal, kilopascal but it's okay. Okay, so now we will start refueling. So 
you drag this and into the spent fuel twice. The first time it goes blue, the second time it goes red. And I advise you to mute the alarm during refueling because it's too annoying. And when it's red, you insert the new fuel, one and two into each channel. Okay, we also got warning too many rods removed and this is because fuel burn up is quite high. So let's keep refueling the first row, not looking too much at the alarms. Okay. Two fuel elements per channel. Third channel. Two fresh bundles. Fourth channel. Okay, two fresh bundles. And look at the charge, how crazy they are during refueling. That's why we need to decrease power set point to more or less 90%. I dragged two bundles into this, but you see it didn't change to green. So probably I dropped one outside because I didn't hit this little square. So let's see with the radiation monitoring in the next minutes. So the important is to drop the spent fuel in this area and to do drop the new fuel exactly in this area. One and two. Okay, after refueling one row out of the five rows, we get up to 53% fuel burn up. You see all these oscillations, we get two problems with these oscillations. I will connect back the sounds of the alarms. <coughs> One is that you can get a too high neutron flux. The second one is that we get a neutron rate above 8%. So this is an alarm. I think 12% is scrum. So acknowledge everything. And immediately we go up to 100% power. I forgot, but you can do this right away after the last uh, fuel bundle. And you see the center core only is engaged. I don't know why. It should not be during normal operation. During normal operation, it should be disengaged. Central core only is used during startup to get the most homogeneous possible uh, activity distribution longitudinally in your reactor core. But later, to have a higher controllability of the reaction, you need to have it disengaged so you act on, on all the control rods, not only on the center core control rods. And I think that's why I got the warning of too many rods withdrawn, because normally 40, I think we are at 46 percent of fuel burn up. You don't get this warning yet. You get this warning like at below 20 percent burn up. OK, you see, we very quickly recovered to 7600 kilopascal of pressure and the valve opening is at 100 percent, generating Power is 1034 megawatts. Some people get confused bet between reactor power and generated power. Basically, reactor power is thermal power. So it's how much heat is generated by the nuclear, nuclear fission. While this generated load is the power generated by the generator, which is attached to the shaft of the turbine. And roughly, Generated load is one third of reactor power. This is because of thermal efficiency of the system. Because we are exchanging heat, so this must have an efficiency below 100% by definition. And basically it's around one third, which is very normal for any kind of uh, thermal power plant, even internal combustion engines like gasoline petrol engine or so. Recently, I think Mercedes made an engine that reached 50% of thermal power. It's for their F1 engines. But I mean, road engines like the ones you will get for a regular utilitarian car, you must be around 30-35% of efficiency. Okay, everything looks okay. Income is 330. Why I'm getting no 
malfunctions. I mean, I know I started with the easiest level, but I expected at least one malfunction. So for the moment, we are just keeping this under normal operation and refueling. We did nothing else. So while we wait, I will switch from PAM number two to PAM number three, which is mislabeled to number two, but actually it's one, two, three. I just do this to make sure three is working. So in case of an emergency, when you want to switch, you don't realize it's malfunctioning, the number three. So to turn on a pump, first you need to open the inlet valve. So here I'm opening the inlet valve. The discharge valve needs to be closed. So once the inlet valve reaches 100% opening, I will turn on the pump. Okay, it's almost 100%. I turn on the pump. And once it goes on, yeah. Okay, now we can open the discharge valve. And you see it slowly opening. Technically, we should wait until this reaches 100% before closing the pump too. But I will go ahead and just switch off the pump too because this is already like more than 50%. We get a warning. I acknowledge it. And once the LED goes off, then you can close the discharge valve. Not before, or you could cause a dynamic effect. And I will... Okay. Have you used your fuel monitor lately to check yeah, the fuel uh, in your reactor? I, I just I refueled. You do so. I just did, I promise. Okay. So I will leave the inlet open because in case of emergency, you need to quickly turn on the pump number two. You, just, you already have the inlet open. So it saves time. Anyway, the discharge is closed, so the system, it's, it doesn't go, fluid doesn't go through this, this system. Okay, let's have a look at the polisher. It's at 25%. You know what happens when the water is clean? Polishers last very long, so you may be able to use a polisher for hours before it needs to regenerate. What can make the polisher dirty is um, it's a condenser tube leak. So if you look at the diagram, the condenser is this system here that condensates the steam coming out from a turbine and it works with water from the outside of the plant. This is basically natural water from a lake or from a river. Uh, actually in Chernobyl it's from the Pripyat Lake, if I'm not wrong. So this is basically dirty water with the minerals, organic matter. And if there is some leak in the, in the condenser, this water will pollute our demineralized water. So conductivity will start going high and the polishers will start to clog up. So if you see this conductivity going up very quickly while the polishers are still okay, for sure in some point of the system you have some pollution probably in the condenser. For the moment it's totally fine, below 2%, totally okay. Okay, generated load is 1,025 megawatts. Neutron flux, 99.9. .9. There is a trick to slightly increase generated on something is going on. Too many rods removed. 43%, why I'm using so many fuel? Okay, yes, with many rods at 0%, these are totally withdrawn. So I will go ahead, reduce power to 90% and reduce the second, uh, refuel the second row. Silence, please. First channel, okay? Second channel, okay? 
it's so nice that the refueling is not buggy. It's the first one I use an RPMK version <coughs> where ref refueling works. Okay. And the last one, fresh bundles. Um, what's going on? Why this didn't turn blue? Come on. Oh my god, uh, I'm doing the second row, but I just was trying to act on the third row. I don't know what's going on. If this happens, just close this window, open it again. I just said it's not buggy and this happened. It doesn't work. Low main steam temperature. Maybe the refueling is blocked when you have low steam temperature. Let's increase it to 75. 75 okay let me check it's still recording yes let's be careful with pressure set point changes change no more than 500 kilopascal at once because very big changes in steam flow to the turbine could cause the turbine to vibrate because of differential uh, temperature deformations. Okay, let's see if I can refill now. What's going on? I don't know. I didn't do the last row yet. Look. I don't know what's going on. I will try with the third row. It's not working. Oh my god, I tried this ported version before and it worked without problem. Okay, let's try it later. We still have a fuel burn up of 48%. This will give us some time. But if later it doesn't work, I will need to fix the fuel consumption. Well, to be sincere, I will do it now. So 47.8, let's, let's see if it works. So basically, this bypasses the need to use cheat engine, which I uh, used before to stop fuel burn up. Now we just have this very convenient option here. Okay, you see a valve, valve control signal is struggling to keep the pressure set point at 7500. And I will increase power set point 200. Okay, so everything goes fine. I will make a test. I will see if the reactor can work only with one recirculation pump in each loop. So if we go to the schematics, we see we have two pumps on in each loop. One is offline. And this is according to the manual for nominal operation. Actually, above 50% of power, you need two pumps. This is not totally accurate to reality because in reality, there were, there were I think, four pumps per loop. And... If I remember well, three were supposed to be on during operation. But this is a simplified simulator. Even if it has most of the functions, it's not as complex as the real plant. Okay, so before turning off the pump two for any emergencies, I will prepare the pump three in case I need to connect them immediately. So I will open the inlet valves of PAM3, loop 1 and loop 2.
This will allow me, if things go out of hand very quickly, to switch on PAM3 and open discharge valve to try to cool down the reactor core. Okay, generated load 150. Let's remember this value. Going down, but quite slowly. And let's see what happens after disconnecting. PAM2 off. PAM2 off. Outlet valve close. Outlet valve close. Are you aware of the fact that loop two has low flow in your reactor? Yeah, Check I'm just. Check your circ pumps. Make sure you got two of them running. Okay. Do something. You've got to get flow up on that before you yeah, open yeah, yeah, fuel yeah. bundles. I'm just running a test. Okay, and you see temperature already increasing. 833 Celsius in the left. 819 in the right. Voiding before was 20 more or less, now it's 30. So as I said, voiding is the volumetric quantity of steam within the reactor. So now we have 30% steam, 70% water, more or less. A particularity of this reactor is that it has a positive uh, void coefficient, which means the voiding increases reactivity. So the more steam we have, the more reactive the reactor is, which is have you used your fuel monitor lately to yeah, check? Yeah, yeah, which is the contrary of what happens to normal BWR reactors, which are which are like twenty percent of nuclear reactors in the world, in which the more boiling, the less reactivity. This is a quite safe feature because uh, let's say you just run away from a dangerous situation and you don't operate the reactor. The more heat the fuel produces, the more boiling. So this will uh, have um, produce a negative reactivity loop, which will end up uh, making the reactor safe by, by itself. This is the contrary. If you just walk away in an emergency situation, more heat will create more steam and more steam will create more heat. So this is a positive feedback loop, which will grow exponentially. So we should be really careful with the controllability of this reactor. Among other things, one of the design features of the reactor says that at no moment or at all time, you should have the equivalent of 15 rods inserted into the reactor to keep controllability. So with less than 15 rods inserted, you lose the controllability because you rely too much on boiling to create reactivity, which is not safe because uh, in front of a critical runaway, the rods that you have left within the reactor core are not enough to control it, which is what happened in the accident in Chernobyl Unit 3. Well, there was a cascade of things, but basically this was one of the main design features that led to the accident. Okay, we see valve control is almost 100%. I will just reduce power set point to 74%. So we don't have these oscillations here. 74, 0, 0, 0. Sorry, two zeros. Yep. I will check this recording. <clears throat> so it seems it works perfectly. High up voiding. Generated load is slightly reduced. So while we have the same neutron flux and same thermal power, it seems that less of this power reaches the turbine. And this is because you have less transfer between the reactor and the drum. Because you have less... Uh, I will go to the schematic. This is a loop where basically water circulates like this. And approximately one-fifth of the water goes mm, converts into steam and goes to the turbine. So what we do when we reduce the number of recirculation pumps is to increase the ratio turbine uh, steam feed to recirculation discharge. And this makes uh, two things. One is makes the process more unstable because any perturbation of the turbine 
will perturbate more the neutronics and thermodynamics of the reactor. And second, makes the thermal transfer less efficient because basically you are running the reactor more hot, which produces more loss of heat in the area of the reactor before it reaches the drum and boils and ultimately goes to a turbine, which generates useful work. So I consider the test to be finished. We are producing our, around 1000 kilowatts, uh, sorry, megawatts, which is like 5% less of what we were producing with two pumps. So I will switch on the pump. Now I will go for the pump number three. So on, on. And open the discharge valve. And you will see the voiding now decreasing to 20. You see the drum pressure increasing, you see the drum steam flow increasing. And the generated load, 1066, this will stabilize after everything goes flat and I think it will stabilize around 1050. Okay, there is a little trick to increase a bit more generated power you can slightly reduce pressure set point in the deaerator from 148 to 123. With this pressure it still works, but because it requires less steam that is collected from the main steam line, there is more available steam going to the turbine to do mechanical work. So this allows to increase maybe around 5 megawatts or so. That, that's just a little trick if you don't reach the end of the month with your budget. But I mean, within, according to the user manual, this should be a bit higher, the pressure set point. Okay, so I think we go through, we went through most of the main features. Of course, I didn't have time to talk about everything. But I will do more videos, maybe with a higher difficulty level, because we didn't have any to do any repair. So I think it was already one hour or so of gameplay without not even one malfunction. And malfunctions are selective, so I don't know why. OK, so the last thing I will do is to, to have a very exciting finale, so you can imagine We'll try to see what's the maximum set point. You see it's 105. Neutron flux slowly catches up, 105. You see the spike here, neutron rate. And you see all the trends go to the, basically to the limit of the chart because this is within the operation limit. Generated load at the 149, so now we are making more money. Probably this increases failure rate, I don't know. <clears throat> so if you want to go above 105% of neutron flux, there is no other way that switch off the automatic control and pull rods manually. So to do this, I will go to the slow setting. Fast was selected. I will switch off automatic control and let's see what happens to the rate nothing happens let's see what happens to the flux 106.4 so it seems it's increasing okay so if you do nothing as i told you this is a positive feedback design so it, this will just keep increasing more and more fast there are negative feedback loops like the fuel temperature the more the fuel heats up the less reactive but still, because you have the positive void coefficient, this could have a critical runaway very quickly. So we are at already 109.8%. Why is your neutron flux so high? Get it down, get it down. Go to manual and get your neutron flux down right now. Hey, calm down, man. I'm just doing a test. Okay, so 110% of neutron flux. Let's see where 
can how much can we reach I wanted to pull rods but actually because it's increasing I think I will not pull rods because of the exponential tendency it's very difficult to control by pulling and holding and inserting rods so I would rather because it's already very high the neutron flux I would rather keep it this way you see the jump pressure it's increasing kind of uh, following an exponential shape reactor is start to decrease the level so probably I will start one feed pump more to keep the reactor with a good level of water One it, once it lights on we'll open the inlet valve on okay that's a discharge valve sorry on okay that's good uh, now the reactor should go back to normal level I will also start the third condensate pump in case the feed water pumps run dry. Neutron flux had some fluctuation here. We see react uh, fuel bundle are you damage. The fact that you have low water quality in your condensates. Yeah, you see all the bundles are damaged. It's this symbol. Have you used your fuel monitor lately? To and now I will pull rods. We are already at 135% of neutron flux, 39. You see the neutron rate going very high. Okay, so that was it. So the reason why I pull rods at the end is because if you very slowly increase, increase, increase neutron rate, you could damage uh, fuel bundles in a way that the reaction will stop. It, it depends because it could get off the, out of control, but it could also, because of the damage, somehow the water will get into the thing and it will not create a catastrophic explosion. It will just create a meltdown or something. So I just wanted to make sure like we have a critical runaway in a proper fashion so that's why I did this way so okay i hope you like the video maybe in next video i will i will do as a shift operator or chief engineer or plan manager to see if we have some malfunctions thank you for watching see you in the next video bye